me start by uh, introducing our speakers and panelists uh, today. I'll start with Anne Pramajuri. Uh, Anne is the CEO of Exelon Utilities, formerly CEO of Commonwealth Edison in Chicago, uh, one of the largest utilities uh, in the country, something like $33 billion in, in revenues. Um, 10 million customers scanning all the way from Chicago to Philadelphia to, 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 to DC. Um, some of the key initiatives that Ann has focused on, uh, grid monetization, uh, a smart grid program, um, as well as really uh, investing billions into monetizing the distribution and, and transmission uh, system. Kind of separate sister company is the generation side of, uh, of Exelon, uh, one of the largest generators uh, in the country, about 30,000 megawatts of capacity across really all of the fuels and nuclear, gas, wind, solar, and, and hydro. Um, I believe a Chicago native, right? That's really where, where, your, where your roots. Been there many, many years. I'm so, a Midwesterner. So I like to say Commonwealth Edison really was the source of the first major electric utility revolution. And we're now talking about the next revolution. I, I started in the sector 35 years ago, and the book they gave me to read was Samuel Insel. And so all oh, roads, all roads lived, lead yeah. to Thomas Edison's disciple, Samuel Insel, and, and what he did to electrify uh, Commonwealth Edison, and it all went from there. So It's interesting. Some of the dynamics we're seeing are sort of going back yeah. to pre-insole and, you know, sort of, um, you know, pulling the system apart, he pulled it together. So it's just kind of interesting to see how history sort of comes around. So I suggest if, you're, if you become fascinated with everything electric utility, read about Samuel Insel, read his, read his biography. Thad Hill, uh, the CEO of, of uh, Calpine, about 10 years with, with Calpine, uh, recently led a $17 billion take private uh, transaction of, of Calpine. And, Proud to say that, that we put $2 billion into that transaction, so we like it very much. This is one of the largest independent power uh, producers in the United States, 26,000 megawatts of generating capacity, serving about 21 million homes, uh, 80 power plants in, uh, in 17 states, um, about the largest generator here, here in California, about 7,500 megawatts in California, owns the largest renewable facility. I call it kind of the backbone of the renewable program here in California, about 10%, uh, the geysers big baseload renewable, we love baseload renewable, uh, geothermal uh, up, up in the Napa area, and then 22 uh, natural gas facilities here in California, uh, almost 7,000 megawatts of, of, of natural gas. I suspect some electrons finding this way, their way into this building very well may be coming from, from, uh, from Calpine. Also about the largest natural gas purchaser um, uh, in the country uh, as well to serve all these uh, facilities. Uh, you might be surprised the independent power sector has been one of the best performers in the market this year, uh, up almost 50% uh, from, their, um, uh, from their lows. So uh, we're going to dig. Doug, I yes. should mention we actually uh, help serve Stanford um, as an energy supplier to, to Stanford, providing all of the, a lot of the services that Stanford needs to meet their energy needs since we're here. Well, let's kick it off. I read it. There was a, a NERC, the uh, uh, Reliability uh, Council in the country, put out a report yesterday warning that the accelerated shutdown of coal and nuclear plants could lead to power outages, uh, shortfalls of surplus generation, uh, and transmission problems. Uh, we've already had about 45 gigawatts of coal shut down over the past few years. Uh, we've got another 20 or so coming in the next five years. We've had six nuclear plants shut down. We've got another 14 nuclear plants slated to be shut down. That's about 20% of our nuclear facilities in this country. So, you know, with that, that uh, backdrop, you know, the utility of today that we talked about yesterday focused on uh, reliability, cost, and carbon footprint versus the, the utility of, of, of tomorrow, um, where we really want to talk about reducing that carbon footprint and um, doing it while keeping reliability high and keeping costs down. And I hope we talk a lot about cost uh, today. So maybe if we can start and go a little bit through, through the fuels, and we had Governor Brown talk about the uh, aspiration of 100% uh, renewables. So maybe let's start with the proliferation of renewables and the ramifications of 100% of renewables, um, feasible ramifications, um, coal and nuclear coming out. So let's start there, and Thad, if you want to kick sure, that off. I'll, that was a, a very large topic that was just introduced. Solve it so, all in three, yeah, you three did. minutes. So I'm, I'm gonna, I'll start with the renewables, and then um, I look forward to getting to the broader fuel mixes where Anne and I may have a disagreement, actually, but, but, or maybe not. We'll see. But, but, uh, but on the 100% um, uh, renewables, look, 100% renewables shouldn't be the goal. The goal is about carbon. 
in my view, right? It's climate change. So it's not about how many renewables, it's about um, lower carbon. Uh, and so let me kind of phrase the question, how about 100% carbon free uh, generation? Um, and you know, you know, that is incredibly unlikely and unbelievably expensive for a long, long time. Um, and I actually think that a little bit of the focus on that right now, I believe is misplaced because while certain areas of the country are pursuing this incredibly rapidly, it is an extraordinary cost. And there is a huge potential to decrease a lot more CO2, which is what we believe in, at a much lower cost by thinking a little harder about the public policy pursuits that are going. I mean, as a quick example, you know, it's pretty easy to do the math that behind the meter solar costs several hundred dollars a ton of carbon reduction, where you can reduce carbon for $5 a ton in the Midwest with a little bit of a carbon price by shifting coal to gas or other type of generation. So I, I think we should probably redefine the problem, which is how do we get as much carbon out as fast as we can at a reasonable price to get on your cost? Uh, you know, I, I mentioned I don't think it's viable, almost regardless of economics. And we've got a study that a third party has done that we're still working on. But to kind of touch on it a little bit, um, we've kind of taken, we've taken California, um, the governor's mandate for carbon reduction by 2045, and said, how can we solve for this CO2 mandate in California? Um, it, it involves, um, uh, you know, massive electrification, but you actually get to numbers very quickly that you need 200,000 megawatts of solar and 100,000 megawatts of batteries, and, and you start piling all that together, you still need more gas generation than there is today, albeit at a very small capacity factor, because to actually chase that last CO2, ton of CO2, you're spending well north into the four and even five digits a ton of carbon. So I really do think we should focus on how can we get as much carbon out and do it in the most economic way for now. And maybe because you're you know, on the customer side of the business and we heard, we heard expensive, uh, I think the average retail rate here in California is something like 24 cents, a lot higher than uh, uh, your customers are, are paying. Um, you've got nuclear in, in the mix. And there's a lot of discussion of subsidizing nuclear as a zero carbon, and I bet the two of you may have different views on, uh, on subsidizing carbon. Um, I, I, pay, I have a home in San Diego. My, my marginal rate that I pay, believe it or not, is 55 cents. And, um, you can, and my average rate is 54 cents a kilowatt hour. That's crazy rate design here in California. You can just do the math on kilowatt hours of what that bill might look like. So uh, when does the pushback come from customers? And just talk about cost and customers and, and, and their focus a little bit. Yeah, I think we, we think about that a lot. I, you know, first of all, I, I'll start by saying I um, completely agree with that in terms of how we frame the question. And, you know, our vantage point is we're trying to get to a decarbonized end state, um, which is not just looking at the power sector, but at the transportation sector, at the industrial sector. And, you know, we're spending a lot of time looking at, you know, how you get there and what you need from each sector in order, order to get there. And it's quite complex, um, and it takes a lot of strong policy to get there. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, something we're considering. So I think, you know, we're, our view of the world is very much aligned on that. And, and our thought is you want to get there as cheaply, as quickly, and with as the least disruption as possible. And when I say least disruption, you know, we run the world's largest economy on the power grid. And so we don't have the luxury of, you know, sort of breaking and disrupting and, and not managing what we've got. We've got to be able to innovate while we keep the system we've got running. And that's one of the big challenges, is sort of making that innovation and that switch uh, on a system that exists and, and has certain physics associated with it today. Um, and I do think we want to think about the largest toolbox we can in terms of getting there timely, cheaply, and, uh, and with the least uh, amount of disruption. So, when we think about affordability, one of the things that, one of the dynamics of uh, the, you know, what technology is driving and what uh, is, is creating uh, among customer in terms of wants and, and behavior is, if you look at any digital transformation, there is a great desire, so customization um, becomes much more choice, becomes much more available to consumers, and they know that and they want that. And um, we've got a, a model 
um, a financial or a pricing model that actually is, you know, holds everything together. And uh, as you start to pull off uh, portions of uh, of customers um, to certain, you know, unique uses, um, whether it's, you know, solar and storage or, you know, some um, other sorts of uh, unique use, uh, you start to um, disrupt that, that common pricing model. And one of the things we think of serving uh, major cities where the poverty rates run from 19% to 26%, depending on the, uh, the city, uh, how do we serve? We're a universal service provider. That's the business that we've been in for 100 years. How do you maintain that balance? How do you maintain social equity? How do you assure that the benefits of the clean energy system get out to everyone and the costs are fairly allocated? And it's a big question. Um, we're thinking a lot about that. And uh, we think the pricing model is one of the biggest questions on the regulated uh, side of the business that we have to tackle going forward. And, and if I could on the pricing model, I mean, the way I describe it, and again, in complete agreement, is 120 years ago, you know, I don't know what the right number is, 90%, 95% of the entire cost and capital structure of energy delivery is actually fixed. And 120 years ago, when the first grapes were designed, it was designed, let's pretend they're variable and charge the customer on a variable consumptive risk. Well, what's happened now is that it's misrepresented the cost of actually the variable component, and you've gotten all kinds of disintermediation going on. And so, you know, we're in full agreement. Um, you can't treat an enormous fixed cost as a variable cost and think you're going to get rational economic outcomes. Um, and because of that, um, that's driving a lot of the issues. Your 50 cent bill in California. I mean, you know, again, we'll, to, to use an example, um, in California, there's a lot of rooftop solar. If it costs 16 or 17 cents a kilowatt hour and you're paying 50 cents on the margin, of course you deploy it. If you're in ComEd or in Texas and you're paying 9 cents or 10 cents, of course you don't deploy it. It's not that you don't want to do what's right for the environment, it's that you know, you're know you charging less. But the real variable cost to that 50 cents is very, very small. Yeah. It's part of the disruption. And I think one of the biggest challenges we have is not to preclude um, innovation and unique uses, but how do you design, redesign a system that allows for that, but also maintains a balance on you know, sort of the universal service concept. And it is a really tough economic and policy question that we have to tackle. Well, uh, you use the word balance, and we used to focus in uh, fuel diversity and fuel mix on balance. We now seem to uh, all roads, natural gas, natural gas, natural gas. Uh, so a couple questions about this bridge fuel that I guess we're, we're, we're calling it. But um, is natural gas generation being fairly compensated for the role that it's playing as backing up renewables? Almost it's our, it's our storage of today. Is it a good idea to become so leveraged to one fuel? Um, we have low prices today, but I've seen disruptions before. I just saw that the, the Cameron LNG facility was just commissioned. They finished construction, something like a $10 billion project. That's 1.7 BCF a day of new demand that's going to be um, exported. So talk about this, this uh, uh, all of a sudden rage of this low price fuel that we're going all in on. What are the ramifications? Good idea. Talk about that. Well, look, I, you know, I'm going to, uh, you know, the shale revolution has obviously changed everybody's life, has anything to do with energy. Um, and, uh, you know, although I'll probably make some the positive statements in a minute, I also want to do those with all due humility that in 2008, I, nor any of my colleagues or friends in the industry ever saw the shale revolution coming. So to your point, you don't know what's around the corner, no matter how hard you try. Um, but that being said, it has changed our lives, and there's a lot of natural gas out there in this country. Um, and uh, it is a cleaner fuel. Um, it has become a mining operation, not an EMP-type operation, and it's out there for a while. And we as a country need to make sure that we take advantage of it because it's such an opportunity to have you know, cheaper industrial base than anywhere else in the country. Doug, you, you started off asking about natural gas uh, generation being compensated for renewables. So I'll just maybe start there and then hand it over to Ann and we mm -hmm. can, I think we'll get into a, maybe a broader field debate. But to, to start, um, you know, generally uh, around this country, nothing's perfect, but in the competitive markets, certainly the regulated markets are different. You got to pay a regulated rate of return. So the, I think the real question is in competitive markets. Um, and, and while it's not perfect, things are working reasonably well. It's a little different by region. But we're actually seeing 
a few um, issues emerging, um, and, and I'll, I'll take and I'll use California as an example, but there are other markets too, where um, you know th there's been a public policy push, um, and, there, and to, to, for heavy renewables and storage. Our generation fleet, our gas generation fleet, gets paid for two things. There are some smaller items, but two things generally. One is providing energy. The other is making sure there's capacity there if there's backup need. All right, energy margins go up or down. Over time, I fully expect here in California, to use the local example, our capacity factors will drop. However, there is no scenario I see, certainly in the rest of the natural life of our fleet, in which those megawatts are not going to be needed um, as a secure part of the great critical infrastructure. Today, for that capacity, and this is an example in California, you, you, you get paid if you're available for four hours. And we've actually got a, a bit of a chaos emerging here, again, regionally, because you know, there are a lot of generation units that can provide a lot more than four hours. Other resources are coming in. They're driving gas plants out. But the independent system operator is saying, wait, you're not allowed to go anywhere because we need you. So there's a disjoint between what's getting paid for in the market versus what's actually needed for reliability. And if anybody you know, thinks that's kind of questionable, I'll go back to the bomb cyclone this, this winter in New England. Plenty of snow on top of solar panels, and every peaker in the market ran for a week. In the West, five, you know, a dry year versus a wet hydro year, 5,000 megawatts of swing of supply coming in. Cold, dark winters, you cannot cover that stuff with lithium ion storage. So I do think the models, and it's different region by region, are going to have to continue to evolve. I think people get it, um, and it's happening, but it's going to be, have to be an explosive conversation. And you want to tell maybe your region a little bit? A yeah, little so I, just sort of taking it from the grid side, mm -hmm. um, which is where I spend my life. Uh, you know, one of the things we think about is, you know, we don't have a grid that's ready for the intermittency and can deal, you know, with the inertia issue. Um, it's just not there yet. And so, you know, when you think about bringing on, you know, more and more renewables, we're, we're preparing for it, we're thinking about it, we're designing for it, but it will take us a while to get there. And, you know, back to, my, my sort of point before, we don't get to disrupt the system we've got in order to build the new one. We've kind of got to do it at the same time. And so there's an evolution here that I think we have to be very planful about. And, you know, we all, I think most people have the, the same goal in mind. How you get there um, is a question. And so we're, you know, looking at how we redesign the grid. How do we create a grid that has enough automation and dynamism in it when you no longer, as an industry, control the supply inputs. It's in the hands of many. Um, it's not within your control, either from a, you know, a, a sort of natural you know, resource standpoint. You don't know, when, uh, you know when, when the wind's gonna blow and when the sun's uh, going to shine, and you don't control it uh, from a, you know, just an institutional standpoint. And that requires a tremendous amount of automation in the grid, which is not, you know, not there. We have a long way to go on that, and there's a cost to that. And, and one of the things that we spend you know, time on is just trying to you know, work on design uh, and technology around that, but also uh, have the discussions uh, with consumers, with policymakers about you know, what is needed and, and what, what that will take. So um, again, I think there's an, there's an evolution. We're gonna need time you know, to, to get there. Um, and I think there's, you know, solutions along the way that, that move us uh, uh, faster uh, and, and cheaper. So maybe um, let's bring the storage piece out of that a little more. I think there's, if we're going to follow with some discussion of batteries here, but um, are we ready for prime time with batteries? There's been, I'll call them a lot of experimental projects out there that a lot would, would love to extrapolate that we have the solution. Um, California's got RFPs for storage um, uh, in the marketplace. So talk a little bit of that if you want to go first. Talk a little bit of how you think about storage, batteries. Where are we in, in that area? Yeah, so, uh, you know, storage, obviously, there's, it's getting cheaper. It cannot be supported by purely market economics in any market. You can argue some modest ancillary services, but it cannot be supported. It will continue to get cheaper over time. However, um, and, and I'm just a few minutes ago I mentioned it's an energy play or it's a capacity play. I would argue the current short duration storage is nothing but an energy play because it will do a very effective job if everybody knows the California duck curve. As solar came in, the, the load in the middle of the day got pushed down, but there's this very, very peak 
Storage will be able to be very effective at time shifting energy from one part of the day to the other. Um, and eventually it may be deployed economically to do that, although I honestly believe if it's a true market test, it's probably late next decade before it gets anywhere close, um, uh, at least. Um, doesn't mean it won't happen in California. California can certainly you know, make its own economic calls, but it'll be a long time out. However, the physics of it are the storage cannot provide the reliability benefits that are needed when you have a transmission line go out in a constrained area. When you have a bomb cyclone in New England, when you have a dry hydro year in the West, it cannot be a real true capacity resource. And so, you know, I think storage is going to be an energy type product over time, and I think that will be how it's generally treated with some small exceptions. Um, otherwise, we'll end up having to, um, you know, displace other units out of the market and then come back around and subsidize them because they're going to be needed when there's a dry hydro year. So I, I think it's, there'll be a realization over time, Doug. So ready for prime time, it works. It's been tested. It can time shift. It is not economically ready. I think it's 10 years away. Um, and I don't think it was the current battery technologies that are anywhere near commercializable can ever supplant capacity. I think you know, the challenge is you know, duration and cost. Uh, and, but you know, we're, we're, we're doing some you know, testing of we've got a, a small community-sized battery that uh, you know, can use, use, uh, bring a small uh, neighborhood up uh, on, for backup uh, in the case of an outage, a storm, for you know, three or four hours. So we're looking at um, options to use, uh, use storage that way. Um, but it, yeah, the, but the cost needs to come down. Um, Argon Labs is doing a lot of a lot of work on this. They have a three by five uh, program. Um, in five years, they want it one fifth the price and um, five uh, five times the amount of uh, energy density. And um, and so you know, there, there's a lot of uh, effort, you know, sort of pushing uh, in that direction. Uh, but there's you know, there's still some work to do. I think. Yeah, the cost will come down. The issue is the duration. Mm -hmm. I think for how I mean, it will be very useful. But how much of a role can it play? Let's maybe shift a little to regulated utilities and, and, and maybe talk about um, you know, the integrated utility model. Um, is that uh, a viable model? How is that model uh, changing? A lot of questions about distributed generation being a threat uh, to, to your business. Um, to me, I look at the, the sector. It's been a nice run of rate-based growth. Um, boy, especially here in, in uh, that, that electric bill of mine, I think a lot of it has to do with transmission bringing in uh, um, renewables from remote locations, um, grid monetization, smart grids. There's been a lot of ways to grow the rate base of a regulated utility. So talk about where we are. How are you feeling about that, that business and, and, and where are we headed? Sure. I, um, I think the uh, uh, regulated utility model, the integrated utility model, is still a really, really strong model. And in fact, um, in the era of networks, it's a classic network, and uh, in the era where the platform business model is becoming the predominant business model, uh, eBay, Amazon, it's kind of the original platform business. And uh, you know, I, I, Amazon uses the, um, the their flywheel um, kind of metaphor, where they talk about how they can drive down costs, um, provide a more economic system because. You know, they have uh, providers that they put onto their platform uh, that attracts customers. The customers attract more providers, uh, more customers, and so you get this uh, reduction of cost by this flywheel, um, you know, kind of concept. And, you know, that was Sam Insel's concept, right? When he started the electric business, um, we had disaggregated small businesses all over the place uh, with little dynamos serving small neighborhoods, and he sort of combined them all. And, uh, and you know, figured out how to make the machines uh, more efficient and bring more and more people on. And then you had more uh, rural electrification that brought more and more uh, uh, businesses and, and um, customers on, and you drove down the cost. It's kind of the original platform or the original flywheel. So I think it's a really, really um, useful, uh, you know, uh, physical and economic tool for the future. I think you can think about um, incorporating distributed generation. And the grid actually, I think, optimizes that. I mean, if you think of platforms rationalizing assets, um, making markets more efficient, um, animating markets, those are all the things you think about platforms. And I think um, the integrated utility can, can do that. Um, one of the things that we're doing in Illinois is um, We've created a path for you know solar growth, distributed generation, uh, community um, rooftop 
all the above. And uh, we said to ourselves, well, what can we do to facilitate this if we think of ourselves as a platform business? So we put together um, you know, an online service that allows customers to come on. They can pull down their usage. We have you know, um, maps of, of all the housing in our service territory. You can run the economics on what solar would look like on your home. If that doesn't work, you can go to a community solar kind of project and figure out the economics of that. So we're looking at ourselves as being able to animate that market. So I think the grid um, is really, really valuable as we move forward. I think it does all the things that a platform does. And I think you don't want to lose it. Uh, and I think you can coexist. I think we can coexist. I think there is a way to bring the distributed model together um, to give customers more choice, allow for innovation, and still maintain some of the benefits of having that foundation of, of the network and the platform. And that's how we're thinking about going forward. Um, you know, thoughts on the, the regulated financial model. I think that, um, you know, we, I think the fundamental model is still pretty good. You know, if you think about a model that uh, uh, creates a low cost of capital when you've got a heavy infrastructure uh, uh, job ahead of you, uh, build out, and, and we do. If we want to, if we want to decarbonize, if, if you know, we want to and, and use the grid to do that, and I think it's the most cost-effective way. We've got, you know, we got a big job modernizing the grid to be able to do that. So you've got a big infrastructure build out ahead of you. I think the model, in terms of you know, lowering cost of capital uh, for that project, works really, really well. It has for a hundred years. We have to modify it. We've got to uh, modify it for. Um, I think the questions that are being raised when you look at what's happening in policy debates are around um, what are you spending your money on and is it delivering value? So you see things like performance metrics or performance standards being thrown into the regulatory model. You see um, uh, mechanisms along the lines of, you know, we want to have a, a public discussion about what your investment plan looks like. And those are all questions about we want to know that the investment that's being made is going to generate value. So that's one piece of the model that has to evolve. And the other is the pricing piece of it that I talked about earlier to allow for some customization, some innovation, um, but also you know, maintain some social equity. And that's a really tough question. But I think the, the fundamental model for the grid holds pretty well. Um, but I think you got to evolve it in a couple ways, as I said. Yeah, you know, I, I, I don't think I disagree with that, but I, I, I'm going to kind of come at it from a 30 degree different angle, which is, um, you know, I don't think I'm plugging from the grid um, for a long, long time is a realistic expectation. The grid's going to be out there. So we need our utilities helpful, healthy, and they need to be a wires business, which is what ComEd is. Um, and then kind of, and, and this may be sound a little pejorative, but more or less, the wires need to be the wires and they need to get out of the way and let innovation and competition happen. Um, you know, innovation is gonna happen behind the meter and in front of the meter because they're profit seekers that are out there looking to deploy capital and develop technology. So in my view of the world, let's make sure we change the pricing model, which to be a little over simplistic, is a lot more fixed based on your need to hook to the grid and a lot less variable. Put a price on carbon and let competition blossom, whether it's behind the grid or in front of the grid, and get regulation and out of the way and let it happen. You know, to, to make the point on the deregulated versus regulated, and this is not the forum, I'm a, very much a fan of competition, yields better results and smart people and the profit pursuit are gonna innovate faster than any other model. Um, you know, uh, two stories. One, we sold a power plant um, once to a regulated utility, not that terribly long ago. We staffed the plant with a number of people. The regulated utility took over the plant. They staffed it with 65% you know, more people. Same power plant. And it's actually not operating as well as when we owned it, right? Because we cared about every megawatt, and they have a different model. Um, you know, I, I think you see some of the biggest things in the energy news right now. Um, there are three words that argue against the regulated capital decision making, which is an agency problem, right? Other people are deciding how to invest your money. The grid has to be healthy. Generation, I don't think, falls into that. You know, and they are Sumner, Vogel, and Kemper, right? That's supposed to be funny for those of you who follow that, but, but those are the, 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 the disastrous um, IGCC and um, nuclear projects in the South. We're Southeast. over 20 billion on those three, probably <laughs> well over. Well, over 20 billion on those three. And it's what happens when you actually have other people trying to invest your money. Um, plenty of people are, I mean, smart people, it's price carbon, it's the externality, 
Let's get subsidies out of the way, put a price on carbon, whatever it needs to be, make sure that the grid is healthy, and then let innovation occur, whether it's behind the meter or in front of the meter. We're, um, a lot of questions are coming in, and a whole bunch around electric vehicles. I, I like to, I, I, I get in trouble around here, I, I, I refer to it as the not so emissions free vehicle as 70% of our electricity, roughly in most regions, still coming from, from fossil fuels. Dad, you recently took me on a joy ride, I'm gonna call it in your Tesla. But uh, let, let, let's, <laughs> let's, 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 you did. Let's talk about just a good thing, bad thing, um, for the whole electric system, and, and how do you think about where, where we're headed with, the, with electric well, vehicles? I, 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 look, I, you can't, I don't think you can hit carbon reduction targets that are needed over the coming decades without a massive shift in, in more electrification. I think any numbers that you run, and I won't bore you all with statistics, already done that, and the, but, 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 but any way you run the numbers, you've got to have heavy electrification of transportation to make it happen. Um, the batteries are getting cheaper, uh, as Doug said, it was a joy ride. He was impressed by the acceleration. Um, uh, and, and, and so I think it will play a larger and larger role and actually lead to load growth. Now, the economy is doing well right now, but we actually saw for the last quarter load growth. I'm not saying this is because of Teslas, but we're actually seeing load growth in, in, all, of the in all of the competitive markets over the last quarter. We're seeing load growth. There's a lot of electrification going on, um, more generally in the industry, and it's going to happen. And I think it has to happen if we're going to achieve our goals. So, you know, the, we in the industry, and particularly the utilities, are going to have to be ready for it. But it's exciting to me. Yeah, I agree. I, we're very excited about it. Um, I think it's, you know, Patty Poppy was up here yesterday um, from CMS, um, it, former you know, GM executive, but talking about it's going to happen faster uh, than we think. And it's probably going to happen differently than we think. And, and the one thing that she raised was the idea of uh, autonomous vehicles and the impact of that. And we're gonna see probably more of that more quickly than, than we expect. And I think she's absolutely spot on with respect to that. Um, one of the things we think about is, again, going back to serving cities, urban centers that have uh, high populations of, uh, of, of people in poverty. Uh, so how are you gonna change the public transportation sector? Because the people in our cities uh, many of them rely on public transportation. They're not individual vehicle owners. And um, you know, New Jersey uh, has a, there's an interesting bill pending right now where they look into the public sector and create standards um, for public buses and um, for state-owned vehicles, and you know, really get at um, the uh, you know the, the, the sort of beyond the individual ownership. Um, uh, kind of paradigm, and we think that that's very interesting, and that's something that we're thinking about is um, how do you ensure, again, this idea of social equity, uh, you know, e uh, equitable uh, distribution of the benefits of, of clean systems and, um, uh, and uh, equitable fair allocation of costs, and that's something that, that we think about uh, is, is looking on the public side uh, mm -hmm. as well, but we're very excited. Um, we're, you know, the, the grid probably doesn't need as much um, uh, sort of change on that front as, as people think. In terms of, uh, you know, sort of the, the two-way flows, there's some work to be done there. But in terms of capacity, for the most part, um, we think our grids are, are pretty well situated on that unless you get, you know, sort of really heavy, uh, heavy usage in, in one area. But um, that, that, the capacity issue, uh, the grid capacity as opposed to the energy capacity doesn't look to, to us to be mu as much of a challenge. The communication and how you sort of manage uh, and balance in that world will be, you know, that, that's where the automation comes in that we're going to need in the future. Um, let me switch some questions around regulatory reforms as we, as we try to evolve to a, a, a more of a carbon light footprint uh, out there. Um, what would you prioritize in your minds? I know, Anne, a lot of your career has been on the legal and regulatory side. Talk a little bit about some of the reforms you would think you would, you would put towards the top of the list that you'd like to see. Well, I think the price on carbon is, um, you know, clearly, uh, as Thad said, uh, 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 an important uh, component of this. Uh, one of the challenges in, with our electric system is, uh, you know, they're regulated uh, in 50 different ways, um, minimum, um, by 50 different states, and then you've got a federal overlay for some parts of the business. It's quite complex, and you have very different you know, dynamics in very different regions. You have ec different economic interests, you have different social interests, you have different cost structures. Um, you know, when we talk about innovation and innovators and competitors, you're asking these entities to come in and figure out how to do business 50 different ways. It's, it's 
almost untenable. Um, so doing some things sort of across the board, and I think that um, you know a carbon price is is step one in in at least getting some uh, you know some commonality on some aspects of this. I don't think you ever get away from the 50 state uh, regulatory uh, uh, model. I just don't think that that will happen. But you know if you can get some certainty and stability on uh, on on the energy side, I think that's uh, that's a big start. And then I think you know the, the the kind of elements that I talked about uh, in terms of the fundamental. You know, if we think about and I and I agree with that on you know wires companies. Um, you know, when we think of ourselves as a platform, we don't sell energy. We don't have a financial interest in that. We facilitate the sale of energy between um, uh, providers and customers, and see ourselves doing more of that when there's more providers and more customers, and some doing both. Um, but uh, um, you know, really uh, being able to support with the model uh, that we have, uh, driving cost of capital down, building out the system um, is important and, and having policymakers and customers understand why we're making these investments and doing what we're doing. Um, but, uh, you know, evolving the pricing model uh, becomes important. And, uh, and again, that understanding and buy-in on the investment and ensuring the investment creates value through some regulatory mechanisms seem to be where the, the action is mm -hmm. is happening. Well, I'm, look, I, I agree with that. I, I agree with Secretary Schultz last night for anybody who was at dinner, which is, you know, what's price carbon? Uh, and it should be economy-wide. And so this is pie in the sky. If you ask me what I want out of the Texas legislature next year, or I want the PUC in California to do, or PJM, to, it's different. So if you kind of, you know, give me broad sway, we need to have an economy-wide national cost of carbon. That's really that simple. And all of the one-off mandates that are out there, whether it's RPS or the investment tax credit for the production tax credit or other things need to be cleared out. We'll get much better outcomes. This country is producing more carbon than it should, and we're spending way too much money to do that. And with the price on carbon, economy-wide cost on carbon and clear out the underbrush, we'll get to exactly where we need to be. Um, you know, but we can only hope. In the meantime, we spend our time a lot more tactically worried about how you prevent distortions to competitive markets and from the problem getting worse in the meantime. So. Good. Well, a few minutes, a bunch of questions back. We haven't talked about coal very much. Still the, the fuel uh, most used globally uh, uh, for, for electricity. Uh, we were 70% coal and nuclear in this, in this country not too long ago. And there's a big, big debate. Where, where are we headed? Are we, go, are we going to zero? Can we go to, to, to zero? And our, 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 I like to say our greenest source of energy, nuclear, is that going to zero as well uh, here domestically? So just we'll maybe wrap up with that one. Yeah, so I mean, you know, coal is, I believe, clearly on its way out. I, I, I honestly don't think, um, without major technological innovation, that there's probably room for it. I mean, I mean you know, you can, I mean, look, I don't think there's any data about clim debate on climate. But let me suspend disbelief on CO2, the criteria pollutants, the NOx, the SO2, the mercury. You know, it, that stuff's real. Um, and you don't have it, and, and there's no reason, given how cheap natural gas is cleaner, and it's cheaper, and it's out there. This coal debate, um, you know, we were a long way past it um, until the new administration actually came in. Um, and there were campaign promises made, and now there have been DOE efforts um, around coal. But that is absolutely political. Um, and, uh, and, and I don't think there's a strong basis for it. I, you know, I, I think the grid over the last several years, the competitive grid in parts of the country we're talking about, the prices have gone down for customers, billions of dollars have been invested, the air is cleaner, and the grid, we actually have more fuel diversity than we used to have. So let's to argue with it. So I think that's on the way out. Nuclear is a harder problem. Um, there are benefits from no low carbon generation. However, um, there are nuclear companies, including ANS, that are asking for, uh, uh, you said subsidization, the term I use is bailout, uh, to be a little provocative. But nuclear bailouts uh, that, that are occurring, uh, I'm deeply sympathetic to the carbon benefit of the nuclear generation. Um, I think a right of return on investment of twice paid for assets is probably a little more of a reach, which is kind of what's being asked for. Um, but the sooner we get to carbon, the sooner that issue will be resolved, because yeah. some of that stuff needs to stick around. Um, not all of it, but some of it. Yeah. yeah. Exxon, you're, you're out of coal, right? It used to be. Yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, we, we, yes, we are. Um, so we've um, uh, 
you know, have interests in all, all the other fuels, um, but certainly nuclear is um, the predominant fuel in our mix. And we, you know, we believe that it's important. Um, it will get us to a decarbonized goal uh, faster and more cost effectively uh, than, than wanting to, you know, to move the, the nuclear plants out. We think it's really important. Um, you know, getting back to the idea of you can't break this system and build a new one. You got to work with what you have. Um, and, and try to get to the end state uh, while you know holding together a system and an economy. Um, you want nuclear uh, in that mix, and um, you know we also feel that you know uh, being uh, um, uh, we would like to see the re um, reflected in in the pricing that we see the the value that uh, that it brings to the environment and uh, a cost uh, a price on carbon would certainly do that. Um, but in the meantime, we seek other ways to sort of r have that value reflected in the price. But we think nuclear is really important uh, in this evolution. Good. Well, Anne, thank you very much. Thank you. Dad, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yeah.